Hello everybody from my side. Today we're going to talk about CPU load analysis. So the goal is for you to be able to understand and explain what CPU load analysis is in the context of embedded systems. We will talk about the difference between CPU load and CPU utilization and why it doesn't really matter for embedded systems. We will talk about different approaches to measure the CPU load. And finally, we will briefly discuss how to analyze the data and create reports. And so you will be able to do that from Vinedia. So the agenda pretty much shows what I have just explained. So no need to go into detail here. Let's start by looking at the definition of CPU load. And to do that, we actually have to make the differentiation between CPU and core load. So, of course, the CPU can have multiple cores. If it's a single core system, there's only one core. So, CPU load is equal to core load. If it's a multi core system, then you get the CPU load by average, averaging the core loads. So, I will kind of use, lose, use these two terms loosely interchangeable. In, in this webinar, so don't get confused by that. Usually we are talking about core loads in the context of embedded system. So how do you calculate the core load? Well, first we have the so-called active time. So that's the time when the application execute, when the core executes actual application code. And by dividing that time by the total observation time, we get the load. Alternatively, we have the so-called idle time. That's the time during which the core executes the idle loop, like does not execute any application code. And by calculating then one or 100% minus the idle time divided by the total time, we can also get the core load. And then once we have the load for the cores, again, we can simply calculate the CPU load by averaging those values. So let's look at an example to make that clearer. Here we see a trace of, a, of an application over time. So different tasks are running. And for each of the tasks, we see how long they are running down here. So the first step is to calculate the active time. And I give you a couple of seconds to do that. So the time for which one like those tasks are running, aggregated or summed up, And of course, the time is 60 plus 30 plus 60 milliseconds, which is 150 milliseconds. And then the total time is 20 millisecond, 200 milliseconds. And the milliseconds cancel out, and we get a load of 75%. Alternatively, we could have calculated the idle time. 30 plus 50 plus 20 is 50. And 1 minus that is of course again 75%. So this should make sense by now. So now you understand how we calculate core load for an embedded system. And now there's one caveat here. Actually, CPU load is not really what we have just shown. What we've just shown is CPU utilization. And CPU load may, may have a different meaning, especially in the Unix world and on the Linux server system and in server administration. So practically, in the embedded world, these two terms are used as synonyms or interchangeably. But you have to be aware that there might be a different meaning or different definition of CPU load depending on the context. So if we look at HTOP here, which we can use to, which is kind of like the task manager for, for Linux or Unix-based operating systems, we can see it shows us the core utilization here. And that's usually calculated over a couple of seconds. So it calculates, for example, for four-second windows, how long uh, has the core been active. So that's the core utilization that we've just discussed. Then it also shows the core or the CPU utilization for the individual processes within the system. So they, again, that's calculated in the same way. We take 
the time how long was the process running by divided by how long is our observation window and that's the CPU utilization for individual processes. But then we also have the load average. And you can see it's not a percentage value. And I have explained or I have copied a uh, explanation of how, what the load average is. But basically, it's an exponential moving average this is, that is calculated for one minute, five minute, and 15 minutes periods. And this moving average, this exponential moving average is calculated for how many threads are active, where active means either running or waiting uh, for a specific time window. So the first point to notice here is that this value can be higher than one, right? Like for a specific time frame, more than one thread could be running or waiting at the same time. And that's one of the average one of the advantages of this CPU load. It does not only give you the value that the, it does not only give you the information that the application or the system is under a high load, but it gives you really the insight how high is the load. And that's useful for server administration and it's also useful for scheduling in some cases. In Embedded systems, we should not really have this case that our CPU load is greater than 1.0. And so that's why CPU load is never really used for embedded systems, at least not in classic real-time oriented systems. Maybe in adaptive auto based systems, uh, this, will, this term will be, become more common. Until then, we really can use those two terms interchangeably when I speak about CPU load, core load, task load, I always mean utilization, but you can keep in the back of your head. Uh, if we are talking about Linux, Unix, server world, then this load term might have a different meaning. And if you want to read more about that, uh, this is the resource where I copy, copied this paragraph from. Um, it's a really interesting read. It also explains some of the historical background why running thread and waiting thread is included in a load average and some other interesting stuff. But for now, let's cons let's uh, go back to embedded systems and let's focus on CPU and core utilization in the, in the embedded world. So how can we measure this data? How can we measure the CPU utilization? And the first approach is called polling. So the idea of polling is to read out a certain variable, the so-called running task variable and the running ISR variable over time, periodically. And that those two variables include the information about the currently running task and ISR. And by doing that, by constantly polling, we, can, we know when certain tasks and when the idle tasks are being executed. For example, in this case, we poll 40 times in total and 30 times, like whenever the arrow is red, the CPU is active, meaning a task is running, and 10 times the CPU is idle. And then, of course, by dividing 30 by 40, we get, again, our load of 75%. Now, there are two caveats here. Of course, the, the first one is, of course, that our even if we try to poll every, let's say, one millisecond, our period might vary depending on the load of the memory bus within the microcontroller and depending on the traffic of the JTAG interface. Like if the debugger is currently doing other stuff, it might uh, not be able to read out the data that we are interested in in time. So that's an issue. And then secondly, if we poll periodically, for example, every millisecond, there might be, let's say, uh, very short ISR that only runs for very short uh, time uh, on a, with an offset to our one milli millisecond polling. And, you know, for example, like running always in this gap here between two, me between, uh, two data reads. And then we actually might miss the, this information if we poll with a fixed rate. So you probably want some kind of 
random distribution or cycle, like use a, a constant shift so that we uh, avoid that, that issue when using polling. Currently, this is not implemented in WinIdea, but we are working on this polling-based solution since it is really easy to get data without need for any special hardware once you have a or, or software instrumentation or anything like that. Once you have a debugger available, you can use this polling-based approach. Then next is instrumentation. So the idea is that we add instrumentation to the point where the idle task starts and to the point where the idle task stops. And then we, for example, active start and stop an idle counter. And then by calculating the idle cycles divided by the total cycles, we get, uh, again, the load for that core. This might sound straightforward, but it's actually harder to implement that than it looks. And the main reason for that is that it's like, where exactly does the idle task start and where exactly does it stop, especially, especially like leaving the idle task, you might have to use some um, pre-task hook to do this kind of instrumentation. So it's not easy as, as easy as it sounds. You also have to deal with uh, overflows of the counters, of course. So this is a viable approach and it is implemented by some operating systems but it's probably not the, the best approach. And of course, because you're using instrumentation, it generates an additional runtime overhead. Then similar technique, but this time without instrumentation is the utilization of so-called performance counters. So performance counters are dedicated counters that are used for debugging and you can start and stop them for certain events like data writes to a certain memory area or specific instructions that are being executed by the application. So you could utilize to this to do CPU load or core load calculation by finding an instruction that indicates that the idle task starts and then finding another one that indicate, indicates that the idle task stopped. And then by starting and stopping a performance counter at this point in time, you could use the performance counter value divided by the total measurement time and again get, get the core load. I haven't seen that in practice yet because it's not as straightforward as it sounds to find like the right address for the start and stop here, but it should be um, feasible in theory. So that's that's why I wanted to mention it. Uh, again, I haven't I haven't really successfully tried this in practice yet. And this is mostly because we usually recommend the tracing approach. So for those who are not familiar with tracing, hardware tracing allows you to record data accesses to specific memory areas. And in other words, that means that you can record data accesses to the running task and running ISR variables. And this allows you then to really show the currently running task and the currently running ISR over time. And once you have to, this data, it's of course really easy to calculate the load for the individual tasks and ISRs, but also to calculate the load for the CPU and the cores as a whole. So the nice thing about this approach is, well, firstly, it doesn't generate any overhead, but secondly, if you find out that the load caused by a task or the load on a certain core is too high, it actually enables you to look into the trace and find out why the load is too high. So maybe the task has been waiting for a certain event or maybe a runnable takes too long to execute or there are some other issues going on. So it not only gives you the information that you have a problem, but it also gives you the tool to find out what, what the root cause for a particular problem is. So that's tracing and that's our recommended approach. And then if you have tracing available, and this is not really a separate measurement technique, that's just something you can do once you have a trace recording, you can use a so-called sliding window approach. So the idea is that instead of calculating the CPU load over the complete duration of the trace, you add little windows, for example, like one millisecond windows 
into the trace, like one millisecond, two milliseconds, three milliseconds, you get the idea. And then for each windows, you calculate the load. And this is what's shown down here. So sometimes here, there's always a task running. Your load is constantly 100%. And in other times, the background task is active. So the load is zero. And that kind of gives you a graphic idea of how the load in your system develops over time. And this is especially interesting for highly time triggered system where you might have a base period of one second or one of one second or 100 milliseconds. And then you can use that as your time slice. And in theory, the load for your time slices should always be similar, but maybe there are outliers in, in certain cases. So that's a very good way to understand and analyze such systems that uh, have a, a certain base period. So customers are often asking for are often asking for the sliding window approach, and we provide that by a so-called Vinadia profiler inspectors. <clears throat> then, once you have that data, you can of course analyze it in Vinadia itself. We have a statistics view which looks like that. So here you can see the net execution time for the ISRs and for the tasks. Don't worry about the invalid ISR here. This just means that no ISR was active. And then for each of the net execution times, Vinadia also calculates the, the, the load from that. So that value here divided by the total execution time, as we have seen on the, on the second slide with the example, then gives us the load. And in this case, so we, we, we consequently then have the loads for the individual tasks, but we can also calculate the call load by calculating 100% minus the load of the idle task, which is in this case called default background task. So that's 76.06% in this case. If you want to export this data to an external tool, we currently only provide an XML export and you can then generate um, your own reporting from this XML file. And we are currently in the process of, of generating a, or implementing support for more human readable HTML or PDF based uh, exports. So that's currently work in process. And with that, we already have already finished the CPU load analysis presentation today. So just a little summary. CPU utilization is an important concept in the analysis of the timing behavior of embedded in systems. It becomes more and more important because the, the OEMs want to see how much load the different parts of their application consume. It's also required because of certain safety standards. So having a way to, to do this kind of analysis uh, should, should be uh, like one should like, like this analysis should be available in one way or another. That's what I want to say. There are different approaches to get this measurement. Polling and tracing is are the easiest in our opinion because you don't need any special kind of instrumentation or deeper understanding of the system. And so it gives you the data without any overhead which is nice you can then analyze the data that you record in Windidea, and we are currently working on on better reporting so that you for example can uh, get, get can get a nice pdf review for management all right so with that i want to conclude today's presentation thank you very much for your attention and if you have any questions feel free to ask them or reach out to webinar at isystem.com.